Hi there. Travel and Things presents In Conversation With. I'm your host, David Batsoffin, and my guest today is Ellie Gearing. Ellie, good morning. Should I say good afternoon um, to you in Australia? Good afternoon, David. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really good to see you again. It's, it's been a while. <laughs> it, it has. You and I were chatting just before we came to air the, uh, today. It's, it's been a, over a year because we met in November of 2019, and given what 2020 did to us, it seems like almost a decade ago. It does. My goodness me, it's been a while. But um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. I guess a lot has happened in that time. <laughs> it, it has indeed. Now, where do we find you today? Are you in Sydney? Yeah, so I'm back in Sydney. Um, I didn't intend on being here, actually. It was a bit of an accident. So uh, I came back home in March of 2020. One of my best friends was getting married and I was a bridesmaid. So I'd had flights booked for some time. It was always on the plans. My annual leave was in. Um, so yeah, I left South Africa and then she got married on the 20th of March. And by the 22nd, we were locked down and Qantas had canceled all its flights. And here I am still here. <laughs> it, it was rather strange because you went back to Australia. My sister-in-law came from Australia uh, to be with her mom for her 80th birthday. And then um, COVID happened and she had to scramble to get on a flight back to Australia which wasn't easy. No, I can imagine it wasn't. I mean, I Qantas cancelled my flight and asked me if I wanted to jump on one of the last ones back to South Africa. And at that point, it was all kicking off in Italy and New York and no one really knew how it was going to go. And so at that point, I, I faced a pretty tough decision in, in deciding whether or not I should leave. And um, in the end, I, I made the decision to stay here just to see how it played out um, in favour of security and a bit of stability. So... Yeah, unfortunately, um, I'm here. Although I think maybe I should say fortunately, Australia seems to be in a pretty pretty good place right now compared to some other countries. So it's not all bad. <laughs> you you in New Zealand um, seem yeah. to have segregated yourselves from the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> We're just hiding down in the bottom corner. <laughs> for, for people who are sort of uh, watching this and going, okay, David, so why are you talking to a young woman in Australia who doesn't seem to be wearing a uniform of any sort. Um, you were a guide. T tell, well, you were a guide here in Africa, but do you have a, a background in, in sort of wildlife and guiding, do you not? Yeah, I actually started out in um, research, so animal behaviour research more specifically. Um, I studied in Australia and then I went and volunteered overseas a number of times, con um, contributing to some research projects over there. And one of the first, um, one of my first forays into South Africa, I was a um, volunteer fieldwork assistant for the University of Pretoria. So I went and assisted with some Cape clawless otter research down, um, down on the Cape near Roburg Nature Reserve. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. I mean, that was my second trip to South Africa and I'd already fallen in love with the place and kind of decided that the, it had a little piece of my heart. And so... Um, from there on, it was actually that master's student I was working for who said to me, you know what you would love? He's like, you should look into this guiding training because it is so you and it's everything that you love about South Africa condensed into a seven week course. Like you should go and have a look at it. You would love it. I recommend eco training. So I went and kind of Googled it and looked at it. And that's when I, I literally didn't hesitate to book into my course, which was ended up being the following year. I think it's about five years ago now that I initially went and trained um, to be a guide and, and during that time decided like this, this is it, this is my dream job, I cannot think of doing anything else. Um, it's exactly what I love to do, I love teaching people and sharing knowledge and I'm so passionate about South Africa's wildlife. Um, that's basically when I made the decision that that was going to be the career path I wanted to follow. So, um, I mean, there's a lot more to the story thereafter, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of how it started. <laughs> And you're very lucky with doing research into Cape, Cape Clawless Otters. I've never seen one. Much well, like we didn't see them, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I think we probably saw three in the, in the one month we spent trekking up and down the coastline looking for them. Um, there was a lot of collection of, of scat and um, prey items and that kind of thing. But don't worry, we weren't, we weren't hugely lucky either. They're pretty elusive little things, but they're amazing when you do see them. I, I always equate animals with the Gary Larson Far Side cartoons. I don't know if you're a if you're a fan, uh, because I always <laughs> believe that 
there are animals hiding in bushes just out of our eyesight. They can see us. We can't see them. And they're all going, shh, shh, shh. Let them just go past. And once they've gone, <laughs> then we'll <laughs> pop out and play. That's, that's what leopards do. I'm so sure of it. <laughs> I don't want to know how many leopards I drove past on my game drives. <laughs> You know, I was, I was, you, funny you should say that. I was telling somebody the story just recently. Um, I'd gone on a game drive uh, in Medikwe. Uh, we'd spotted a leopard the night before, and the head ranger and I went out the next morning to see if we could find him. And we found fresh scat with the steam still coming off it. And, we've, and, and fresh, fresh paw prints. I mean, you, you couldn't have wanted them fresher if it had been walking directly behind us. And then we got a flat tire. So we stopped to change the tire and we were scanning the bush and I said to him, I swear that thing is sitting there just waiting, just watching to see how fast we're going to change this and get out of here. We never found him and he couldn't have been more than 50 meters from us at any given point with, with how fresh the, the leavings behind were. Oh, I've got a funny story for you, Dave. So. Um... When not long before I departed South Africa, I was um, doing a little bit of a scouting trip around the block with um, one of our trackers. And there was this male leopard in our area. He was absolutely gorgeous, very, very handsome animal. And, um, but he was, he was very sly, like this thing was intelligent. <laughs> and we had been following tracks of him, hadn't found him, we were driving along. And I was kind of scanning a little bit further into the distance thinking I might see him in a tree or something. And our tracker spotted him beside the road and started doing this. And what he'd done, he'd obviously seen us driving. He, he was so close to the side of the road, I swear, I almost drove over him. And all he'd done is dropped into the grass as flat as he could possibly go. We initially drove straight past him. And then I stopped because the tracker had seen him down the side and looked in my rear view mirror. And he stood up in the road. He had a face like, oh, they spotted me. <laughs> and started <laughs> and um, we were spinning around and following him just for a little bit. We didn't want to outstay our welcome, but he, he, that's the second time he had done that to me, just right on the side of the road where you can't really see over the door. Yeah. He'd gone flat. And I don't, like, he must have done that a number of times and realized it works because you're scanning further away than right beside your door. And so you don't spot him. It was, ugh, they're so clever. <laughs> when, when you share stories like this with your friends and family in Australia, how do they react? I mean, you don't have things with claws and teeth, really. I, I don't see people being attacked by platypus or platypi, whatever the plural is, or wombats. You'd be surprised. Even the male platypus has a venomous spur on its back legs. But anyway, I'm still learning and improving my knowledge of Aussie wildlife because at the moment I've got a very niche South African knowledge. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people do say most of what... Uh, inhabits Australia wants to kill you we do have some pretty nasty little things but nothing like the elephants and the lions and the leopards no it's it's a very um far off land South Africa in terms of its wildlife but um yeah they they listen to my stories and they kind of can't believe it really um when I tell people that I used to you know take a rifle and go tracking lions and rhinos and that kind of thing through the bush it it doesn't it almost doesn't compute like people unless they've had that experience before they don't really know what it's like or appreciate it for what it is and that kind of adrenaline rush that you get when you finally come across something you've been tracking for hours um, especially one of those those big game animals so yeah they they almost don't really know how to respond it's so otherworldly to them <laughs> yeah, if you want to talk spiders and spiders and snakes they're prepared to listen yeah. to that that the australians know know about but not yeah. anything bigger than that. <laughs> no, it's exactly the case. Yeah, it's, um, it's very different. But as you can imagine, they're all very interested in, in the experiences that I yeah. had. And... Is there a possibility of you returning to South Africa? Is it on the cards for you? Or have you sort of re-immersed yourself in Australia and the possibility of coming or the probability of coming back in, in the near future yeah. is not on the cards just yet? Good question. I'd really like to. Um, at the moment, I think, given the situation with travel and the, the lack of international tourism, it's probably not an immediate possibility. Um, I was very fortunate. I fought tooth and nail for a visa um, at the end of uh, 2019. And in January 2020, I scored my three year visa for South Africa, which is a little <laughs> ironic considering I'm <laughs> 
before we're getting stuck in Australia. Anyway, the point being, I, I still have it. So that's really good. So it's not like, you know, without the realms of possibility. But um, I think at this point, I, I have been quite fortunate in finding a, a new position in Australia. It doesn't quite live up to what I used to do, but it's a good contingency plan um, and somewhat related to wildlife. And I can tell you a little bit more if you're interested. Mm. But Because um, I was yeah, going to say, I don't, see, I don't see you marching down the streets of Sydney or you know, across the beach of Bondi carrying a rifle looking for tracks of something. <laughs> I think I'd probably get arrested if I did that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so where I'm currently working, um, again, I was very fortunate um, because obviously throughout the pandemic last year, a lot of people in Australia lost, lost their jobs as they did in you know countries around the world. It wasn't just unique to South Africa. So um, I was unemployed here and in September managed to get a role with um, arguably the, the country's biggest wildlife rescue charity, which is known as WIRES. Um, it may ring a bell to some listeners after the Australian bushfires at the end of 2019 and early 2020, WIRES was one of the key um, charities that people were donating to in order to um, assist injured, and, uh, injured wildlife after the, those massive bushfires that were really destructive to the area. So I'm in WIRES' head office and I'm actually in the training department, which suits me quite well because I'm still teaching people and I, I still get to kind of um, interact with members of the public and um, I run training workshops teaching them how to rescue sick and injured wildlife um, and I also assist in coordinating some of our courses around the state so whilst I'm not quite so hands-on with wildlife in that respect it's more of an admin role um, I'm still feel fortunate to be in a in, you know in a company that or organization somewhat related to wildlife and indirectly you know all of the work that I'm doing is having an indirect benefit to wildlife in the end and, and people's capability of looking after them and rehabilitating them so yeah that's what I'm doing now um, I do still intend to come back to South Africa or at least it's I'm thinking about it it's always in the back of my head um, it's difficult because I when I was working as a guide I really felt like I'd found my place like I, I've never had such um, an intense and um, fulfilling sense of belonging to an area or a place or a, a career kind of thing. And I, I was, as far as I'm aware, succeeding in my role pretty well as well. And so I just, I felt like I'd kind of found where I was supposed to be. Um, and so that feeling is rather hard to shift when you've come back to yeah. Australia and living in the city. Um, so not quite as, as remote as the bush, um, a lot busier, <laughs> a bit more anxiety inducing in that respect, sometimes claustrophobic and doesn't quite have the same healing power as being in nature constantly. Yeah. So it's always in the back of my head. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I could find quite um, an equivalent level of fulfillment in a job over here. Um, as I said, South Africa is really where my passion lies. Even when I was doing research and studying animal behavior, I was just so fixated and, and obsessed with South Africa and its wildlife more so than Australia. So um, I think Africa's definitely, definitely found its place in my heart and, and hopefully um, things will improve with the tourism industry and that will allow me to return and, and continue doing what I love. So we'll see. <laughs> but, but your link hasn't been broken because Bruce Lawson, who's just moved to Australia, one of South Africa's top trails guides, has recently started um, a challenge, which was for him, 30,000 burpees in 10 days. And then he challenged other people to do 1,000 in 10 days to raise money for conservation and for um, anti-poaching purposes. Now, I believe, and I'm not going to ask you to do one, but I believe your target was 1,000 in 10 days and you completed it. Well done, Ellie. Thank you, yeah. As I said to you before, burpees are my most hated exercise. Um, so it felt very fitting in terms of a challenge for me. And I, I think I mentioned to you prior to us coming on air that I, I, I was really concerned about the level of poaching that was happening in the area and lockdown has made it somewhat easier for, for that to happen because there's not as many people driving around the reserves and potentially not as many patrols and obviously with the lack of income to the reserves uh, there's, there's less money that's going towards these anti-poaching teams and so I think um, given the rate that it's increased it's it's becoming going from a bad problem to a very very bad mm. problem um, and I really feel so passionately about it I mean rhinos are one of my favorite animals to see on safari um, and I think hugely underrated one of the most underrated of the big five but um, 
yeah, I wanted to do something. And I was thinking in my brain about what I could do to try and raise money. I was thinking of running challenges. I, I just wanted to kind of physically challenge myself in some way and um, in doing so, try and raise some money for anti-poaching, um, particularly where I used to work. And so the challenge came at the most optimal moment <laughs> because we announced this challenge and I thought, great, I hate burpees. This is an awesome physical and mental challenge. I'll do that, I'll do that. It's amazing, sign me up. Um, so yeah, I jumped on board a thousand. So a hundred a day was my um, my goal. Uh, there was one Sunday where I managed 250 um, fairly comfortably and I was very impressed with myself. And so I took the following day off. <laughs> um, I was pretty sore in the shoulders, but yeah, no, I got through my, my thousand and um, I finished off at roughly the same time as Bruce did and then chimed in to watch him live finishing his un unbelievable achievement. Yeah. I'm still in the awe of what he accomplished. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. He's currently wandering the streets of Adelaide, I believe. I chatted with him yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I and I see he's still continuing his challenge. Even now, he's not in quarantine. So, yep. um, yeah, I, I have no words for how much I admire Bruce and, and his, um, his capability throughout this whole challenge. It's awe-inspiring. Talking about awe-inspiring, what words of, of wisdom would you have for young women who are considering going into what is still predominantly a male occupation yeah um it's hard it's really hard um and people underestimate you a lot so you know and and guys may listen to this and smirk and you know whatever but it's the truth um we get underestimated as women and i think um you know when we're carrying rifles or managing sightings there's almost this air that we're not as capable um, so, you know, I would advise women that they are going to face that and that they must just ignore it and brush mm. it off doing their thing and doing it well, because there is nothing as satisfying as proving someone wrong. <laughs> um, so, yeah, look, it is there and there are more amazing female guides coming into the industry every day. And it's amazing to see how many more women are getting involved in guiding. And I truly believe that it's changing. And the amazing thing is that we do have mentors like Bruce um, and some others I've had the experience of working with who are really empowering women um, and, and not tearing them down. And Bruce is one of those people who, it doesn't matter who you are, male, female, um, unidentified, he'll empower you to try and be the best guide you can be. Yeah. Um, and it's thanks to mentors like him and, and others who are changing, helping us to change the industry and making making it easier for young female guides to to get into the industry and feel respected and feel supported. Um, but there's uh, there's still a little way to go. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. unfortunately, I mean, I've been on vehicles where people have, seen, you know, a, a female guide has been comes out to get into the driving seat. And you can see the look on the guests' faces going, really? We've got to put up with this? You know, she's going to I've cry if there's a kill. <laughs> yeah, I've had that before. I've, I've, not often, like I have, to, I have to preface this by saying it wasn't, it wasn't common, mm. um, but I had, had a number of occasions where I turned up um, after lunch and I introduced myself to the guests and they go, oh, are you our guide? And I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm Ellie, nice to meet you. And they were like, oh, okay, we didn't realize we were getting a female guide. And I was kind of didn't really know what to say. I was like, okay, well, surprise. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and you could tell that they would, they, they, it was especially people who'd been on safari before mm. and they'd always had male guides in the past. And so to turn up and have a female guide, they were quite surprised by that. They, they weren't necessarily underestimating me, but they were interested to see how the experience compared. Right. Um, and I, off the back of those kinds of um, guests often had comments saying that they felt like um, my approach to the animals was perhaps more sensitive or more respectful. Um, and, you know, they really actually enjoyed the experience, um, not to devalue the, the experiences they had with males. You know, there's some unbelievably competent and incredible male guides out there, but um, the, the comments I received was that they really appreciated the kind of different approach to the wildlife and the more um, more perhaps like sensitive or nurturing approach that female yeah. guides might have. You, you and your ex-colleague hold very special places in both mine and my wife's hearts because your colleague showed me my first pangolin and allowed me to spend an hour and a half with the, with the critter. And then you, not to be outdone, take my wife out on a drive that evening and find yet another one. 
I mean, I'd waited 53 <laughs> years to see the first one. And had I gone out with you that gone out with you that evening, and I didn't because it was drizzling, and I think I had some work to do, um, I would have seen my second one within 24 hours. So, so I mean, both of you are very <laughs> special to us. <laughs> I mean, you can't be too greedy. You did get one no. day. That was also my first pangolin too. So. <laughs> We were both in the same boat with our levels of excitement that morning. True enough. When when I after the sighting and when I came back to to um, the room and I said to my wife, "Look, I've seen the pangolin," and it wasn't even a case of, "Are you going to get the tattoo?" It was a case of she just went, "Where are you going to put the tattoo?" And I said, "I haven't <laughs> decided yet, but it's I'm getting it," which I did when oh, I got I back. I, I recall you immortalized that moment. <laughs> oh yes, indeed. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Eli, um, thank you so much for spending time and chatting with me today. I wish you all the very, very best. And I do hope that in the not too distant future, you're able to, to return to South Africa, pick up where you left off and continue to be the very special person and very special guide that I know you to be. Oh, thanks, Dave. That's really kind. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, it, it was so incredible I feel so fortunate to even have had the you know the year and a half that I had guiding and sharing my passion with people and sharing really special moments so I hope you able to continue that in the future and I'm sure we'll cross paths when such a time comes um you'll have to come visit me wherever I am so yeah who's hoping I'll be able to take you on another special safari we'll find another pangolin for you <laughs> <laughs> my guest today on in conversation with has been Ellie Gearing once again Ellie thank you so much for joining me